my everything. The speaker tonight, Debbie. They gave me a stage tonight. I feel really important. Well, thank you all so much for being here. And uh, by the size of the crowd tonight, I'm guessing that there's not an awful lot to do on Tuesday nights in the middle of July. <laughs> Otherwise, you might not be here. We have a lot of new faces tonight, um, clients that have been around for a number of years, but this is their first opportunity to attend one of our events. So welcome to you. We have our repeats who've had uh, the ability to attend many of our events, so welcome to you. And, uh, and we have our guests tonight as well. So welcome everyone. I hope you've had a good evening so far. And a lot has happened since we were together in January. So I have a lot of ground to cover tonight. And uh, before I begin the presentation, just two quick things. Um, one, my staff has already exited and um, they do a phenomenal job. And we've got a large staff of advisors We've got four different offices. We've got a very large clientele, and it runs like clockwork. And in addition to keeping everybody where they're supposed to be every day and every week, we put on two of these every year, as well as some other smaller events that we do during the year. So they have a tremendous job. So I'd like to personally thank them, even though they're outside already. And just a quick personal night note before we begin. Um, my son did find exit stage right. Um, but tonight is his 26th birthday. There he is. And um, almost exactly, so we called him the triple sevens lucky baby. Seventh month. 7.05, and it's 7.07 .07 right now, 7.05 p.m., and he came in at 7 pounds, 11 ounces, so our triple sevens. So I'm going to ask you guys to help me out, and it's not to sing happy birthday because he would kill me, but by a show of hands, who thinks that he should get the day off tomorrow for working late on his birthday? <laughs> All right. So I know he's going to hold me to that, but he's happy and we get off cheap, so works out for everybody. So with that, I want to jump into the information that we have to cover tonight. And we are going to, and I know it might be a little bit challenging in the back to see everything, but I will make sure I try and talk you through these screens so that you know what you need to look at, but I'll hopefully be able to give you enough cue along the way. The theme of tonight's presentation is going to be a tale of two markets. Since early this year, we've had a phenomenon that's quite unusual. We've had declining interest rates, which typically signals a slowdown or possibly a recession. And it's good for bondholders because as interest rates go down, bond prices go up. And yet the stock market's telling a completely different story. As you know, we continue to make new highs in the market. Higher stock prices are a signal that things are good and that there's growth out there. So how could it be that both markets are functioning and telling two completely different stories? And typically we say one of them must be right. Maybe they can coexist for a period of time. We're going to talk a lot about that tonight and some of the other things that we have to pay attention to in order to get an idea of where we'll be next year. For those of you that know the drill, we're going to talk about where we've been, where we are, and very importantly, what do we need to pay attention to going into two, the back half of 2017. But as usual, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of challenge tonight to get your brains going after you've had an hour to have some food and a couple of drinks, so we'll get your minds going tonight. So we're going to talk about a lot about data tonight, and that I can make a statement here, or I can show you some data. And if you have 10 people, you'll probably get 10 different opinions about what that data is showing. So I'm going to give you some practice this evening of analyzing the data. So this first graph, you can see each state is represented with a different restaurant or chain. And this one's really pretty straightforward. 
It's simply telling us that in different states, either the most popular restaurant chain there, where one was founded, or headquartered. So really pretty straightforward. That's your easy giveaway. This one's a little bit more difficult. So there's two shades of purple. Those states prefer one item. The other two shades of green, they prefer something else. The source of this is a Washington Post wonk blog, and maybe the regions will give you a little hint of what it's talking about. Yeah, I wouldn't have guessed this either. Well, the purple states are dog people, and the green states are cat people. And for those of you that care, there's more than two million more cats than there are dogs. This one, I think the bottom legend really gives it away. So this is the number of sightings per 100,000 people. And down on the bottom, it tells you those sightings increase. And they have it denoted as drinking hours. I guess we call that evening hours. So maybe you can guess what that is by when the sightings occur. Yes, it's UFO sightings. And I really need to share what it says on here. It turns out that aliens are considerate. They seldom disturb Earthlings during working or sleeping hours. Rather, they tend to arrive, especially on Friday evenings when people are nursing their fourth beer on the porch. <laughs> Just so you know. This one, you need to be a little bit creative, but I think you could figure it out. Each state is represented with a different country. And this is really pretty remarkable. This gives you some insight into how big the US economy is. Take California, for example. You have France represented there. In 2015, California, by GDP, was the largest state in the US. If it were not part of the United States, it would be the sixth largest country in the world. New York and Texas would be 10 and 11. So it just really gives you some insight as just how big and powerful the US economy is. And the last one, and probably my favorite, and it's similar to one of the market commentaries that I did a couple of months back. And it's tough to see from the back, but it has a dollar denomination on each one of the states. And you can see Massachusetts is 93, Rhode Island is 101. What it represents is the purchasing power of $100 per state. So here in New York, it's worth 86 bucks. All you got to do is drive down the coast, the Carolinas, your, your $100 is now worth 109 or 110 respectively. So it kind of gives you some insight as to why people are migrating away from New York and taking their money somewhere else to spend. So, now that you guys are all data interpreters, and we can all figure out that when we say one statement, everybody understands it exactly the same. So let's jump into this evening, and we'll start with politics. And I'm going to talk about politics in a little bit different way. Let's talk about how politics affects our perception of things. In The Economist magazine, they, they published a study and it says the economy itself likely has not a lot to do with how people feel about the economy. And let's take Venezuela, for example. That bottom legend, the horizontal axis, is GDP growth. Your vertical axis is a percentage of people who have a positive outlook about their economy. There's Venezuela. Their GDP is expected to contract by over 7.5% this year. The food shortages are so severe that three quarters of the population has lost weight involuntarily. Yet if you talk to the people who support their current president, almost 50% of them will tell you their economy is doing well. Let's talk about what's happening here in the United States as far as perception. This is a study that talks about the change of perception between June and December during an election year. And for those of you who are not avid graph readers and even can't see this, you can see one striking thing. There's a broad divergence in the attitudes in the United States right now. 
Let me explain what this says. After President Trump was elected, if you talk to a Republican, the red line, they'll basically tell you that we're on the dawn of a new era of growth. If you talk to a Democrat, we're screaming right into a recession. And the opposite was true when we elected Obama, that the Democrats in this country felt that things were going to get better, and the Republicans felt that things would get worse. Reagan's an outlier. The Republicans didn't support his economic policies. They actually, actually thought that things would get worse. But perception drives a lot of things about how we feel and then ultimately what we do. Well, how is the economy doing? Let's put it in some raw numbers. That little tiny bar chart far right of your top graph that's GDP in the first quarter of 2017, not even 1%. But again, if you talk to the analysts, they talk about an economy where at full employment, consumer, sent consumer sentiment is high, earnings growth is good. So they'll tell you that what happened in the first quarter is simply transitory, probably had to do with the weather. weather. First quarter is usually typically the worst quarter. But we got a lot of catch up to do if we're going to see growth get over 2% with the first quarter coming in sub 1%. Let's talk about some of the other indicators about how our economy is doing right now. Top left hand graph, unemployment. Unemployment has declined dramatically over the last five years. We sit today basically at full employment, about 4.5% unemployment. And we can argue all day long about the quality of those jobs, where they are, and there's lots of problems in the employment market, and I agree 100%. However, workers today feel more emboldened than they have in many years. That typically will translate into their willingness and ability to spend. So it is an important factor where we are. Right graph. Consumer confidence. Right after the election, consumer confidence soared. It has kind of leveled off. But people in general are feeling good about how the economy is right now. That bottom graph, inflation. Inflation remains stubbornly low. We're at less than 2% inflation. And there's lots of questions about why. Is it technology? When you look at some of the things that are happening out there that continue to drive prices down, are we measuring it the right way? A lot of questions remain. But what we do understand is that the Federal Reserve has a dual mandate, inflation and employment. There is a dissent within the Federal Reserve right now about inflation failing to go above 2% and if, in fact, they should continue to raise interest rates or not. Kind of paraphrase the, the uh, quote here. Neil Kashkari, who is one of the voting members of the Federal Reserve, he basically says, look, I get it. I understand that when you have full employment, it will lead to higher wages, and ultimately you'll get pressure on prices, and we will get inflation. However, we're not there. And he disagreed with the Fed's position in raising interest rates this last quarter. And it's going to be interesting as we move into the second half, if inflation remains low, can the Fed justify continuing to raise interest rates? That's one thing we'll have to pay attention to. So what do the markets think? Markets around the world are doing great. Top line there, 15% return. That's the Dow Jones um, Asia Pacific Index. The next one, the S&P 500, is up almost 10% going into the second half of the year. The next two lines there are the European Stock 600 and the Nikkei, both up about 5% this year, and the FTSE is up 2% this year. So markets around the world are doing well. There's one more statistic I heard today that I think really relates to this that I found interesting. There's another asset class that's performing really well this year. Any guesses on what that is? Gold. How is it that we have bonds working, stock working, stocks working, and gold working? Gold's up almost as much as blue chip stocks this year. Well, one of the reasons that the stock market could be doing well is that earnings 
are doing well. We are right now in the beginning of earnings season, and we're not far enough in. We haven't seen enough reports of what second quarter earnings really look like for me to tell you whether I think it's a continuation. But the first quarter was actually, I'll call it spectacular. 75% of the companies in the S&P 500 beat their earnings estimates. Earnings were up 14 to 18%. It's the best showing we've seen from corporate America since 2000. And 11. So corporate earnings are doing really well. Now, expectations are changing. And look, we're six months in, and we've gotten nothing from Washington, right? And I'll say, the bad news is we've got nothing done in Washington. And I'll say, the good news is we've gotten nothing done in Washington. Let me explain what I mean. That top line there represents the expectations coming into 2017 that we were going to get corporate tax reform, individual tax reform, and health care reform. Well, you can see all three of those lines over the last six months. Expectations have sunk that we're going to get any of that at least any time soon. And today was another reminder that we're not getting anything done. The second line is consumer confidence. And all of a sudden, we had a spike up in confidence. And once again, we saw that trail off, and nothing has happened. The bottom line, the, the bottom graph, the light blue line, the spike up, that's the price action of companies that have very high tax rates. Hopeful that we're going to get tax legislation. The bottom line is companies that are tied to the infrastructure industry. Lots of hope. Everybody made big bets. And what do we know happened? All those things kind of came back down. So why is that good news? It tells me that even though these expectations have declined and that people are not hopeful that any of these things are going to happen anytime soon, the market sits at record highs. That means if we do get pro-growth legislation later on this year, the market can, in fact, trade higher from these levels. So this change in expectations does make a big difference as far as what we think is priced in right now. You know, I wouldn't stop talking without talking about interest rates. The first graph on the left-hand side is a chart of long-term interest rates. And you guys, many of you have been around with me for 10 or 15 years, and we've watched this year after year, this graph of interest rates declining year after year after year. The graph on the right is the one I want you to look at. There's three different um, pointers there, indicating three different time spot slots. Those are the three times that the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates, December, March, and June. And you'll notice after each one of those, interest rates did what? They went down. And although the Federal Reserve is raising short-term interest rates, long-term interest rates continue to trend lower. At the very far right of the graph there, you'll see there is a spike. In mid-June, we had a reversal in interest rates that was very sharp and pretty dramatic. And it may have something to do with what's going on around the rest of the world. If we look here, of the 12 central banks around the world, only four are raising interest rates right now which makes it very difficult for our Federal Reserve to kind of operate on an island by itself and continue to raise interest rates. But in the middle of June, Mario Draghi, president of the ECB, came out and talked about how well the European economy was suddenly doing, and that his expectations were that Europe would begin to raise rates sooner rather than later and it sent shockwaves through the interest rate markets and the currency markets. What we don't know now is, are they really ready to raise rates? How close are they? And what impact will it have 
if, in fact, Europe begins to start raising interest rates as well. We've got a divergence in what we call soft data and hard data. Soft data is the way we feel. Top line, consumer confidence. Boom, confidence is up, things are doing great. Bottom line, the hard data. Retail sales, manufacturing numbers, mm, flat line. Haven't seen any indication there at all that things are getting better. So the question looms, will the soft data convert to hard data? That we don't know yet. So what does this mean to investors? We sit here today, and you can feel bullish about the fact that we've got full employment and consumer confidence and earnings are doing great, yet people are really skittish. And you can feel it in the markets. And most money managers today will tell you that they feel highly confident that a lot of the good news is already priced in and that we need a major catalyst for the market to go higher from here. So given where we are, there's a sense of what do I do at this point? The emerging markets are doing great. And we brought this up, and we'll talk about this again later on. We brought this up last year. Over the last three to five years, the emerging markets have underperformed the developed markets. We came into January talking about the fact that a likelihood that money would look for value, and it may look for markets outside the US. And that's exactly what we've seen. China's up over 20%, India's up over 20%, Mexico's up over 20%. The emerging markets are doing extremely well. It may have to do with the fact that the US markets are considered expensive. We call stocks expensive based on what we call the P-E ratio, the price to earnings ratio. And that chart is giving you where the current P-E ratio is. The dotted lines in the middle are the historic levels, the five and 10 year average of PEs. So you can see we're well above the averages. We're not near where we were in the year 2000, but certainly if you look at the market, it's expensive. And I wanna break this down a little bit. And it's a concept that I don't think people are talking about enough. When we talk about the market being expensive, we're talking about the S&P 500. It's an index of 500 companies. And we've had massive amounts of capital in this country flow into what we call passive investing, where you just buy the 500 companies that represent the index. So what that means is if I'm an S&P 500, if I manage an S&P 500 fund, and I receive $500,000 in new capital today, I have to go out and buy all 500 companies based on their relative weighting within the index, whether I believe they're a good investment or not. We call it price insensitive buyers that they buy irrelevant to what the price of that company is trading for. And what's happened with the amount of capital that's flowed into index funds, Vanguard, which is one of the largest index funds, owns more than 5% of 491 of the 500 Fortune 500 companies. Think about that. Now, when Warren Buffett or Nelson Peltz or any big hedge fund manager takes a sizable position like that in a company, it's because they believe there's investment merit there. But indexing is causing this phenomenon that money is flowing into companies irrespective of their price. And what concerns me is if the world decides to not want to be indexers, that it will be price insensitive when it goes to sell out of those funds as well. So it's certainly something that we're paying an awful lot of attention to. And when they talk about the market being expensive, I would agree the market is. But I think there's great pockets of value out there. And it's an incredibly good time to be an active money manager, where you're actually picking and choosing what you want to own. There's something that's called the CAPE ratio. And I, want, I don't want to dig into the weeds about how the CAPE ratio is calculated or anything. But I do want to talk about a comment 
that was made by the gentleman who founded the CAPE ratio. And it's really a, a historical PE. It's supposed to take a longer term look at PE ratios. And it was founded by Robert Schiller. And Robert Schiller is somebody to reckon with. He is a Nobel laureate. He's a professor at the Yale um, School of Economics. And he was recently interviewed on CNBC. And it was this comment that really caught my attention. What he says is that the CAPE ratio is high, which means, again, it looks expensive. And you can go back to about 1998, and we were here at those levels then. But that the index continued to rise for another two years. And he finished his statement by saying, and we could go there again. Now, Bob Schiller, I've listened to this man for over a decade. He's probably one of the most conservative I'd call him outright depressing, dour kind of people. And for him to make a comment that we could continue to see these ratios extend for another couple of years was pretty remarkable. Value stocks are underperforming. And again, we can break down the market in a lot of different ways. Value stocks would represent things like financials, energy, utilities, telecom. Growth is your um, technology biotech, cyclicals, industrials. And if you look at the last 10 years, the growth has been winning the race, and pretty handily. Over the 10-year average, it's beaten it by over about 3% growth versus value. So as investors or as money managers, the question would ordinarily be, should we give up a value strategy? Should we be in companies that haven't been working for the last 10 years? And my answer to that is probably the exact opposite. And I'll equate this to when we were looking at the emerging markets last year, is that right now is probably the time that you should be looking at some of those value industries. That's where the opportunities lie going forward. And interestingly, the cover story in Barron's this past weekend was oil. Oil is the worst performing sector this year. And what did we talk about in 2016? It was the best performing sector last year. So as we're looking for what we're owning in your portfolios, we take into consideration not chasing what has been working, but making sure we're looking for where the opportunities are going forward. Of all the things that we've seen out there this year that seem quite perplexing, the fact that bonds and stocks are working and the gold is working, this is one that is really, really unnerving. There's what's called the VIX or the volatility index. It's better known as a fear gauge. And volatility has been literally non-existent in this market. Since the index was founded back in 1993, there's only been 16 times that the VIX has closed below 10. Eight of them are this year. What does that volatility mean? We just don't know. There's very little data. Schwab did a study and said, following extended periods of, of lack of volatility, the market typically goes higher. But if eight of those 16 are just now in the last six months, there's not a lot of data to support what happens when we come out of this period of low volatility. There has been no shortage of things to literally rock this market that have failed to make the needle move. I can say there's been probably more days that I have woken up in the morning to go downstairs into my gym and flip on that television that my response is, here it is. This one will be it. We've had bombings in, in, in Afghanistan, air, air raids in Syria, terrorist attacks around the world fears of the political environment here and everywhere else. And yet, the market remains completely complacent with all of these things. So where does it mean it's going to take us in the second half of the year? We are in the midst of what is being referred to as a synchronized expansion. And bull markets do not die of old age. And the fact that we're right now 
in the midst of the second largest expansion in history, that doesn't keep me awake at night. What we want to pay attention to is where are we in the business cycle? What's going on out there that's going to change the momentum that we've been in for the last several years? And right now we know that the U.S. is somewhere between the mid to later stages of the business cycle. And what is that earmarked by? It's a transition from accommodative monetary policy to tightening. It's the change from profit growth to profit restriction. It's when credit changes from being easily and readily available and very cheap to becoming hard to get to and much more expensive. That's a transition in the business cycle that typically will create inflation and you move into the latter part of the stage. So we'll be paying attention to where those things line up and if it becomes inflationary, and will it ultimately slow the economy down. Global growth is expected to continue. The bar charts, that's expected GDP worldwide. So you can see 17, 18, 19, worldwide GDP is supposed to grow. The red line embedded inside the bars, that's developed market GDP, which says, Developed markets are not going to grow all that much. Top line, emerging markets. That's why I bring up what's going on in the emerging markets. We got to know if they continue to do OK, because over the next couple of years, it's expected that that's where the growth is going to come from to continue the global expansion that we have going on right now. What's going on with earnings? Earnings are expected to continue to grow. And you can see the first, the darker orange is 2017, the lighter orange is 2018, that we're supposed to continue to see earnings growth. But I want to point out something really important that we're seeing in earnings. Because it's not just about them growing, it's important to understand where they're coming from. For the last couple of years, companies have been beating on the bottom line. Now what does that mean? Revenues, are your, revenues come in and then you have your expense line. And over the last couple of years, companies just say, cut the expenses, cut the expenses. Revenue remains flat, but we have a nice profit. We call it manufactured earnings. They really didn't bring any more money, but they continued to show you better earnings. What we're starting to see now is that the actual top line is growing, and companies are beating on the revenue side. They're not having to do cost cutting to get a better, a better bottom line to their shareholders. Very, very important. These are solid earnings, and it does make a difference as far as where those earnings come from. The word for the second half would definitely have to be caution. And you know, I, I hate cliches, you know, where we're cautiously optimistic. But my goodness, when we met in January, we talked about the forecast for a lot of the annual analysts was 8 to 10% this year. And I remember feeling myself, my God, we came off a great 2016. If you give me another 8 or 10% year, we'd all be happy. But well, we're there. And we're only halfway through the year. I mean, the good news is the market doesn't know what the forecast was. So it doesn't really know, and it doesn't know what time of year it is. But right now, we're definitely pushing up against some pretty tough statistics. Since 1950, there have only been six times that the market has gone longer than a year without as much as a 5% correction. So when you think about where we are, a correction is likely somewhere in our future. We have what we call a Goldilocks scenario right now. We've got low interest rates, we've got improving earnings, we've got a strong labor market, we've got calm inflation. Well, how do we always feel? There must be dark clouds on the horizon somewhere that something bad is bound to happen. That's kind of the way it goes. So there's three things that could really rile this market. Number one, an economic slowdown. We don't see that in the near term in any of the fundamentals that we're looking at. Number two, a domestic political implosion. And number three, a geopolitical blow up. The problem with number two and number three, 
You can't predict them, and they're absolutely immediate. So we know that it's out there, but again, to try to trade around these events is literally impossible. I would rager to bet that if anybody over the last 18 months was trying to trade the headlines that we've been through, they would have been wrong 9 out of 10 times. So we know these things exist, but trying to trade around it is a tough game. This is something I think is important to address. This is a, um, a prediction by Mr. Hussman that in order for the S&P to get back into normalized um, rates based on where the fundamentals are, that we would have to see a decline of somewhere in the neighborhood of at least 50 to 60 percent, and that would just get us back to normal. So that really, a, for a correction, we'd have to see a drop of a magnitude of either even greater than that. I bring this to your attention for two reasons. I do get questions from clients about things that they've read on the internet, things that they've gotten mailings for at home. And you know, you read this stuff, and it literally makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. You, know, you pull your statements out, and you say, my god, do I have the right thing? Should I be invested in this market? And so I say, number one, you got to be really careful about your sources and understand what the source of some of these are. And in Wall Street, we refer to it as talking your book. So I saw this, and I happened to take a look and look up Mr. Hussman. And he manages some mutual funds. And Mr. Hussman's fund this year is down 7.5%. He's down 14% since the election. And he's lost his investors 41% over the last five years. He's been betting against the market for a long time. Even if we do get a 50% correction, it's not going to make up for the damage that he has done in making very bold predictions like this. So again, we understand, you know, when we get into this record territory, it is unnerving and we understand that. This stuff sells newsletters, it sells all kinds of advertising. But I'll just say, you know, caution, you know, be careful of your source. I always jokingly said, you know, raising my kids, if it's on the internet, it's got to be true. So we know it's out there and it influences your emotions. So these are the things that we're going to pay attention to. Look, we've got political risks around the world. We know that we may be at the end of an era of low inflation. As inflation rises, that will squeeze profits. We know that we've got problems politically. What will our foreign policy mean? What will, what will protectionism potentially happen? What happens when we move into a period of higher interest rates when countries around the world are carrying massive amounts of debt? How will they finance that debt as interest rates start to go up? How will that affect the banking system? There's every number of political as well as economic risks that we will be taking into consideration. But again, trying to trade around this stuff is not a smart idea. We're going to pay attention to sentiment. How are consumers feeling? And what I want to know is will that soft data, now that you know the terminology, will the soft data convert to hard data? And here's something interesting. Last Friday, we got an update on those retail sales and manufacturing numbers that I showed on an earlier slide that were up to on the first quarter. And guess what? They disappointed again. Retail sales are not improving. Manufacturing numbers were down. We got some soft data today in the real estate sector, and it wasn't good. But last Friday, when those numbers were posted, what happened? We closed in record territory. So here's the way people are reading the data again. How do people interpret it? So stock investors look at the, looked at the data and said, eh, you know what, we're growing at 2%. The numbers are a little bit soft, but 2% is pretty good. I'm liking the way things are. The economy's not heating up. Inflation's not going to come around and ruin everything. So a little bit soft is, is OK. We're going to buy more stocks. Bond investors took a look at it and they said, huh, this is great. Data's soft. The Fed's not going to raise interest rates anytime soon. The bond market went up again. So, you know, again, we've got this scenario where people interpreting the data, reading it the way they want to, and deciding how that that should play out in the assets that they want to own. So I am a firm believer that attitude will affect behavior. 
And so we want to pay attention to consumer sentiment. And then there's investor sentiment. How are investors feeling? And the investor sentiment is interesting because I, I call it a contrarian indicator. If investors are really bullish, that's when we want to get nervous because it means they're all in. So today they're not. They're below the averages. They're not overly bearish either. A lot of people are sitting on the fence trying to figure out which way will this market break. But we will want to pay attention. And if the investment community gets overly bullish, that would be a sign to me that they probably bet with their dollars and they've got a lot of money in the market and it might be a time to be a little bit more cautious. And then there's always the central banks that we've got to pay attention to. And now we've got three things to keep attention to the Federal Reserve. Number one, will she, won't she, buy how much, and when? What will happen with interest rates over the coming six months? Right now, the prediction is September is off the table, that they probably won't raise rates again until December, but we don't know for sure. Then we've got to watch the balance sheet. And what do I mean by the balance sheet? Or when they talk about the balance sheet, what does that mean? Remember quantitative easing? Federal Reserve was buying all those bonds. They were the supporter of the bond market. They went out there to buy things to support interest rates and allow our government to borrow an awful lot of money during the crisis. Guess what? They don't want that stuff anymore. They want to delever their balance sheet. They want to get rid of those bonds. As they start selling the trillions of dollars of bonds that they're sitting on, it could be disruptive to the bond market and the interest rate market. So now we got to pay attention to rate policy as well as balance sheet policy. And number three, Janet Yellen's term is up in February. That means the next six months and already in recent testimony, they're starting to ask, ask her, have you been asked to stay? If asked to stay, would you agree to serve further? And it's mom. But if she is replaced and we have a new chair of the Federal Reserve, it could have a dramatic impact on monetary policy and certainly something that we're going to have to pay a lot of attention to in the second half. So to summarize all this, wrap all this up in, in a neat package for you, based on the fundamentals of the economy today, we feel very comfortable with the solid position that we have in the equity markets in your portfolios today. Given the structure of the interest rate market and the fact that the Federal Reserve is somewhat stranglehold right now, that she doesn't have the ability to raise rates aggressively, we feel comfortable with the position that we have in the bond market today. The statistics are stacking up against us as far as the likelihood of a correction. It's going to happen. We don't know when. We don't know how deep it'll be. But it is a healthy thing for the markets. It's a natural process. And as we talked about earlier, and I used Mr. Hussman as a great example of that, betting against this market or trying to trade around it is not a real smart thing to do. So we will remain vigilant. And we will continue to make adjustments to your portfolio based on what the fundamentals of the economy tell us that we should be doing. And there was an article in Barron's about two weeks ago. As a hedge fund manager, uh, Ray Dalio, he manages an extremely large and very successful hedge fund. And I think he put it quite aptly. I hope I get his quote correct. He said, it is our responsibility to keep dancing, maybe a little bit closer to the exits, and a keen eye on the tea leaves. So I think that's very telling. So with that thought in mind, I'm going to wrap up the general part of the regular part of our presentation. And as usual, I do have a quick video clip for you guys. And for those of you that don't know me well, one of the things that I love to do is read. Now, it's certainly good for my business because I do spend an awful lot of time reading. But I happened to read a couple of great books in, in the last few months. And one of them 
left a striking impression on me. And I saw the gentleman interviewed on CNBC, and he was talking about his book, and I followed up and I ordered it. And it's a book, it's called Make Your Bed. And he did a graduation speech at Texas A&M a couple of years ago. And it was the whole idea behind this book. And it's about the small things. This guy's a retired Navy SEAL. And it's about the small things in life. And what struck me is that whether you're 15 or you're 45 or you're 75, what he has to say is very impactful. And it's the way we run our business, always paying attention to the little details that are out there. It's the way I've tried to raise my kids and teach them about those things. So we're going to share just a quick clip, a little piece of the speech that he made. And we felt that the book was impactful enough that we did buy copies for you. And on the way out, so those of you who do enjoy to read and find this interesting, I just ask that we do one per couple. I don't have one for every person in the room this evening. But if you find this something that you think that you enjoy, believe me, I think it will have an impact on your life. And so again, I'll show you the video, but thank you very much for coming tonight. I've been a Navy SEAL for 36 years, but it all began when I left UT for basic SEAL training in Coronado, California. Basic SEAL training is six months of long, torturous runs in the soft sand, midnight swims in the cold water off San Diego, obstacle courses, unending calisthenics, days without sleep, and always being cold, wet, and miserable. It is six months of being constantly harassed by professionally trained warriors who seek to find the weak of mind and body and, and eliminate them from ever becoming a Navy SEAL. But the training also seeks to find those students who can lead in an environment of constant stress, chaos, failure, and hardships. To me, basic SEAL training was a lifetime of challenges crammed into six months. So here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened SEALs. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made. <laughs> that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed.